BBOR Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. In today's episode, I will be responding to the Zodiac Killer propaganda series. I will be reviewing the Black Dahlia episode of the Citizen Detective podcast, that's their Black Dahlia Part 2 episode, and I will be exploring a new Zodiac suspect. But first, I would like to say that today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? I hope everyone had a good weekend. And I will also make the announcement that there is a video that has my name in the title, Ned DeHaan, and it is available on Ray Grant's channel. Now, I said it has my name in the title because I'm actually not mentioned in the video very frequently, but Ray Grant chose to respond to some of the comments that people had left on last week's Zodiac Monday episode. And I just want to be clear, I have no bad blood toward Ray Grant. I have no problem with Ray Grant. And as I said, he really is not even discussing me in a lot of these situations. He'll be he'll be a little bit harsh with some other people, but he is um, not mentioning me in a negative way, and I don't have anything negative to say about him. I still watch Ray Grant's Zodiac Killer videos, and He's doing a very good Zodiac series called The Zodiac Killer Walkthrough. I particularly recommend his video on the suspicious death of Shelley Holmbo. Now, some people believe that Shelley Holmbo was killed accidentally, and I shouldn't even say that. It's that she was killed by wild dogs. I mean, not exactly an accident. Killed by wild dogs, and other people believe that she was murdered. And Ray Grant is in the latter camp, and he states that he believes she was a victim of the Zodiac Killer. And, I mean, the reason why I recommend that one so much is Ray Grant is one of the few people who has done a serious, in-depth investigation into the suspicious death of Shelley Holmbo. And it's definitely worth a watch, and there's a lot of information. And I first learned about her story because of Ray Grant when I was reading his book, Zodiac Killer Solved. So that would be a video that I would recommend. Now for something completely different, I would like to go over to Substack.com. And this is a page that is created by Glenn Wool. Glenn Wall is the author of the book Zodiac Maniac. And he talks about his Zodiac Killer suspect, William Thorson. Now, I responded to Glenn Wall's material in a previous episode, and I did not think very highly of William Thorson as a Zodiac suspect. I said I would give him a 2 out of 10 as a, as a rating or having any involvement in the Zodiac killer mystery. But I wanted to see if I could contact Glenn Wall and ask him if he would like to be a guest on the show. I mean, he's written a Zodiac book, and on Fridays on Black Box Online Radio, I'm trying to put out Zodiac Killer interviews, true crime interviews will be coming out on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and my guests on the program this week will be Chris Todd and Manny Grossman on the Tuesday and Wednesday show, respectively. Normally, I release this program in the morning. You can start your day with some true crime talk radio, but Manny Grossman had a specific request, and he wanted it to be put out in the evening so that everybody could join in the comments section at the same time. Some people are going to be at work and during the daytime shifts. Most people have like nine to five jobs, I guess. I mean, I've never really been a nine to five or I've always had something a little bit different, but he thought that that would be a convenient time for everybody to get in the comments section. You know, it will be released as a premiere so they can, there can be some type of very quick discussions that people will be having. And if you want to follow along with all of these true crime discussions, you can hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps out the channel, and you can also go through some of the links in the description box. One of them is for buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxned88 allows you to make a donation or a contribution to help support the show, and anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. But I got on substack.com because this was Glenn Wall's page, and he has written a series called How to Spot Zodiac Killer Propaganda. And before I read this post here, I want to be clear that I gave him this 2 out of 10 rating, his suspect, William Thorson, that is, but someone wrote into the channel and they said, Ned, what are you talking about? This guy deserves a 2 thousandths of a percentage point rating, not 2 out of 10, maybe point zero zero two out of 10 or something like that, and maybe for Glenn Wall's full package theory, but there were some points in favor of William Thorson being the Zodiac Killer. Number one, he is a suspect in other murders, and Glenn Wall's first book was called Sympathy Vote, which talks about the murder of Valerie Percy, who was a senator's daughter, and he believes that 
William Thorson committed that murder, then he moves to California, and went on to become the Zodiac Killer. Number one, he does resemble the sketch of the Lake Berryessa Voyeur on September 27th of 1969. Number two, you would have to accept the initial premise that he did not write the letters because William Thorson died in 1970. He um, would have been the Zodiac, and then that was the explanation as to why the Zodiac murder stopped, but the letter writer continued to write letters, and that is, again meaning that there were two people working in tandem. I I believe that one person wrote the letters from 1969 to 1971, then there's a halt in Zodiac activity for 72 and 73, and then in 1974 the same person began writing the letters. Feel free to dispute that with me in the comments section down below. But ultimately, I didn't think highly of William Thorson as a Zodiac suspect, and I still wanted to give Glenn Wall a chance. I wanted to invite him on the show to be a guest, because I've openly said that you can have any theory or any suspect as long as I think the person is genuine in their intentions. And Glenn Wall has a series here called How to Spot Zodiac Killer Propaganda. And I'm just going to read this right here. I noticed recently that there is a three-book series called The Zodiac Revisited. It was published in 2020 or a few months earlier, a few months after my Zodiac book went on sale. But this isn't the only reason to suspect it's propaganda designed to keep my suspect, William Thorson, who I have named as the Zodiac Killer, buried in the past. I'll admit it, I have not read any of the revisited books, but I have read some of their reviews, ones purportedly written by readers who bought the book on Amazon.com, and I've read the pitch for it in the for the final book called Tying It All Together. That's also referred to as Zodiac Revisited Volume 3. What struck me is there's nothing in the reviews or the pitches for the books that tells me that there's anything new or anything revealed about the Zodiac case in the series, not even in the final book that claims to tie it all together. Another reason to suspect that the series is propaganda is that none of the books exceed 250 pages in length. In fact, two of them are barely past the 200-page mark. This series could have easily been one book. So if it is propaganda, why was it published as a series as opposed to to one book? The answer appears to be simple, because a series of three books would seem more authoritative and comprehensive than my single book. One more time, Glenn book Wall's book is called Zodiac Maniac. It, in roughly the same number of pages, oh, as it says it in, maybe he means it is roughly the same number of pages, and it is the average length what, he messing up his sentences here. It only took a couple of hundred pages to do that. I had to skip over something because I think there's some typos in this article. Another apparent giveaway of the Revisited series is that it is with a sea of books already out on the Zodiac case. It would not make sense to add another one without coming up with something big, like a good new suspect or evidence that solves the case, unless it was propaganda. It doesn't make economic sense to break up a 600-page, some odd, 600 some odd page book into three books and sell them on Kindle for four ninety nine. Okay, so um, I just have to jump in right there because he has not read the series, and Michael Cole's Zodiac Revisited trilogy does have a first book that deals with the facts of the case, and the second book is looking at the influences about how the Zodiac could have um, created the persona, and the third book t talks more about how Michael Cole's Zodiac Theory happens. And one thing that I think is so odd about this is that you don't have to write a book only if you're revealing a new suspect. And Michael Cole has shared numerous observations about the Zodiac Killer mystery in his books. I confess I did not read the first one because that was more about the facts of the case. Michael Cole actually sent me his second book, and I purchased the third one myself, and I've done book discussions as well as an AMA on Michael Cole's Zodiac Revisited trilogy, which you can find throughout um, the Black Box Online Radio uh, YouTube search list. But with his observations, number one, he talks about how the Zodiac Killer could have been inspired by the book The American Practical Navigator, or influenced rather than inspired, that the Zodiac Killer was using a nautical compass rose to plan out his murders. And Michael Cole is also a believer that the... Um, the murders began in 1963 with the Domingo Sedwards murders, the Swindle murders, Sherry Joe Bates, the five people who were murdered in 1968 and 69, the canonical victims, and the Kathleen Johns abduction, the disappearance of Donna Lass, and the murder of Richard Radetich. 
were all committed by the same person, so he is providing reasons why he supports that theory. And I, th I just thought it was so weird about how how Glenwall chose to call out Michael Cole for, well, more or less, not proposing a new suspect, therefore this has to be propaganda. And I'm going to keep going with this one because I'm going to share something with you guys, and we will find one of the best conspiracy theories that has ever existed. That's why I wanted to focus on this series here. But I also don't think that there's anything weird about releasing 200-page books instead of one 600-page book. I mean, why would somebody have to do that? Why is somebody forced to make a choice like that? And not every writer wants to release a 600-page book. They want to divide the books into three parts because they have different things to say about the case, or kind of like arranging it by su by different subjects. But this is from part two of Glenn Wall's Zodiac Killer propaganda series. Recently, I examined the reasons to believe that the Zodiac Revisited case, the Zodiac Revisited series is propaganda designed to steer people away from William Thorson, who in my book, Zodiac Maniac, I have revealed to have been the Zodiac Killer. William Thorson was responsible for 47 murders that were covered up. So much about the Revisited series tells me that this, from its release date, was released just after my book to the online reader, and reviews and ratings seemed way too high and praiseworthy, and it sounds phony, for work appears to break no new ground or name a new suspect. And I know he's um repeating himself a little bit from the first part, so I'll jump ahead. But there are other reasons to suspect that the books are propaganda. The blurbs for them mention Zodiac ciphers and coded messages, and the Zodiac sent letters to the press. As someone who's written a book on the case, I can tell you that any author, for that matter, or news story, spends too much that spends too much time on the ciphers is suspect. And again, he's going to say that Michael Cole is not an original thinker or something like that. Michael Cole has also attempted to solve the Z32 cipher, and he has other observations about the Z18. So just because he's not naming a suspect doesn't mean he isn't doing any in any work. Absolutely not. What progress has been made in decoding them in the last half century that reveals that they are little more than gibberish? In other words, anyone who wants to distract you from things like this that are actually used to solve murders like facts, evidence, and witness statements, in the Zodiac case, they'll lead you down to dead ends with streets that are called ciphers. This is not to mention that Unlike my Zodiac book, so many books on the case, including the apparently revisited series, seem not to explore the possibility that the case involved a cover-up. I am far from the first person to believe this. But there's another reason to suspect that these books are government-manufactured, big-tech-promoted shams. Their author, Michael Cole, who purportedly won, and nearly won, a number of bogus-sounding book awards, did so with true crime titles that appear not to break any new ground or involve a new theory, Moreover, there's nothing about them that I've read that indicates that Cole did any investigative work, or has ever done so regarding a crime or worked as a reporter. No, but Michael Cole is not a reporter. He's actually an engineer in his in his day job, and he, that's how he gets this understanding about how the Zodiac was plotting crimes using angles on maps, and I frequently cite Michael Cole's Zodiac Revisited Trilogy when he talks about not only the book The American Practical Navigator, but how the Zodiac would have had a high understanding of not only mathematics, not only the sciences, but also astronomy. When people hear the word Zodiac, they want to immediately start thinking about astrology, but what Michael Cole says, look at it in terms of astronomy, like there's a lot of thought that went into the Zodiac murders. I've already noted how the Twitter files confirmed what many suspected. Big tech companies have been censoring Americans, and in some cases disfavored media sources for years, at the behest of the U.S. government. So what does Michael Cole do He's when he's not writing award-winning true crime books? According to his Amazon bio, he works for Intel. What's wrong with that? I mean, like, yes, that's my interjection. What's wrong with that? What's so hard to believe about that? Something telling me that a guy who was smart enough to have contributed to the design, implementation, and validation of numerous GPUs, CPUs, and chipsets over the last quarter of a century, as his bio states, wouldn't be selling his books for peanuts. Rehashed information about an old case that's available online for free, and about which dozens of books were already written. Meanwhile, in my recent piece about the revisited books, I mentioned the reasons to suspect that a video from the true crime series on Valerie Percy and her, her murder is propaganda. I noted that the Twitter files 
revealed how the U.S. government pays big tech companies to censor on its behalf. It is suspicious that the True Crime series video is horribly written yet boasts major production values, like having actors reenact scenes from its comments section it looks to be filled with phony-sounding praise, that it rocketed to the top of the YouTube hoop searches, which are owned by Google, and that is also a giveaway. Now I'm going to jump ahead to part three of Glenn Wall's Zodiac Killer propaganda series. One more time, that's from glennwall.substack.com. And there's another giveaway. Though the series has purportedly, he just loves that word, he uses it way too much, purportedly won numerous awards, I have not been able to locate a single review for any of the books that appear to be written by a journalist or professional writer. As someone who self-published a book on the Zodiac case that did garner some press, I know that this doesn't make sense. In other words, aside from the bio that appears for Cole in places like Amazon and Goodreads.com, I can find nothing that proves that Cole actually exists. As I said, this is the best conspiracy that I have found in a long time. This is actually going up in my top 10 all-time favorite conspiracy theories, that the Zodiac Revisited trilogy, written by Michael Cole, is a propaganda piece, and Michael Cole, the writer, doesn't even exist as a real person. I mean, I couldn't believe this stuff when I was reading this, and I was like, well, did this guy, like, write this stuff two years ago? I mean, who was I talking to on the Zodiac Killer interview with the expert series. I'm also the host of that program, and I've interviewed Michael Cole off the air and on the air. And, I mean, did you do a single Google search or something, Glenn Wall? And by the way, Michael Cole's name is Michael F. Cole. And I kid thee not, you can find this on Substack, too. I think it's in his fourth part. The F stands for feds. He does say that, but I'm pretty sure he's joking about that. But it does appear, he does think that Michael Cole's Zodiac Revisited trilogy was released shortly after his book was released as a way to distract the general public from the truth, as a way to distract true crime sleuths from the truth. Yeah, that must be it. And Michael Cole isn't even a real person. He's, um, what? Okay, okay. Now, immediately, I was like, no, I'm not bringing this guy on the show. I wouldn't want to interview him. And I said, if I thought the person was genuine, but he's going into the category of, I wouldn't touch you with a 39 and a half foot pole because you're just saying a bunch of weird crap at that point, And I don't think that we would have any type of valuable discussion. But wait, there's more. I often tell you guys that I rarely hold back what I really think about someone's true crime analysis, but there is one thing that I did hold back in regards to Glenn Wall's um, Zodiac book, and the reason why is because I can't, I can't prove it. I mean, this is just what I think happens. This was my gut instinct, my initial reaction. He wrote a book about Valerie Percy called Sympathy Vote, about the murder of Valerie Percy, and he also talks about how he believes his suspect murdered Judith May Anderson. And maybe he wanted to write a Zodiac book to draw attention to his other true crime writings. And, I mean, if it's done just to boost his own writing career. Now, the reason I didn't say that in the previous episode was I can't prove that, that he wrote a Zodiac book for an, for attention. And I don't even think like that anymore. I, I've i been reading his articles, and it seems like he's a genuine believer in his theory, and it is a crappy, pathetic theory, to be honest, that this guy who barely resembles anything in the Zodiac killer mystery, William Thorson, was the Zodiac, goes on to accuse him of 47 murders, and then in another article, he actually ups the total. I mean, let me see if I can find that one. That that one is in part four when he reveals the um, full the full like body count list. I think it was like 95 or something, 94. But he's saying that this guy, William Thorson, was a very prolific serial killer who m murdered over 90 people. So here's what some people do. They choose a suspect, and then they're almost playing a game and as what I was talking about, about not being genuine, to them, it's just, how can they make other true crime stories fit with their suspect? Anne Penn does this, John Cameron does this, Anne Penn has the Golden State Killer as her suspect, she accuses him of 200 murders, John Cameron has Edward Wayne Edwards as a suspect, he accuses him 
of 660 murders. They're just looking at other true crime stories, and they're trying to figure out how all of these things could fit together. And I have to say that I'm very disappointed in Glenn Wall. And again, I'm going to be clear. I don't think that he... I no longer stand by the idea that he was making up the Zodiac theory to draw attention to his other work. I don't stand by that anymore because it appears that he is somewhat dedicated to his to his work here. But the problem is, the problem is that he just got so outlandish accusing Michael Cole of being an operative for the feds or that the, the, the concept of Michael Cole, uh, that he doesn't even exist. I mean, that's just getting too weird for a reason, and being weird is not a crime, but sometimes it can get you into trouble. Maybe that's a fair way of putting it. So I just have to uh, say that I don't really think Glenn Wool and I would get along at all, and I don't think that he has a whole lot of information to share, but it does appear that he did some very original research looking into the murder of Valerie Percy, Maybe that first book, Sympathy Vote, deserves a closer look. So if you'd like to share anything about William Thorson as a Zodiac suspect, please put your ideas in the comments section down below. And I would also like to remind you guys that this episode that you're listening to today is brought to you by Capital One. The Capital One Quicksilver gives you a $200 sign-on bonus just for joining. It's like getting free money. And if you'd like to know more about that, you can ask me, or you can just click the link that will be posted here with the quick reference and in the description box. One more time, if you sign up for the card, they will give you $200. It's amazing. I've done it myself, and I recommend it. But I should point out that I learned about Glenn Wall's book, Zodiac Maniac, because of Amazon.com, and because I do a lot of Amazon searches about Zodiac killer books, sometimes a new Zodiac book pops up. And one of them that showed up was Zodiac Killer by Moses Sandeep. And this is something that really surprised me for the following reason. I'm just going to read this description. This is actually from PenguinMagic.com that says, Zodiac Killer is a propolis multi-phase mentalism routine. I was like, what? What? I mean, at first I was like, what's he talking about? Explore the wonders of the Chinese Zodiac and well your audience by disclosing their birth year, Chinese Zodiac sign, and perhaps a particular person they have in mind. It doesn't even end there. Even if you just recently met someone, get ready to provide startlingly accurate assessments of their personalities, passions, and preferences. This routine has three exciting phases, and each heightens the audience and performer's sense of excitement and anticipation. That's not all, though. But wait, there's more. I had to throw that one in there. There are three additional effects that come with Zodiac Killer to improve your performance. You don't need impression pads or anything. Zodiac Killer utilizes nothing that is mentioned in a completely propless effect, a system that allows readers to be more creative and make their own effects. So, um... I I was completely shocked by this. I was like, what? He's just taking the name Zodiac Killer and he's attaching it to some type of Chinese astrological people reading abilities. And at first I was a little bit appalled, but then I remembered that I've done some similar things here on this channel. And I also used to run a channel called Astro Psych 400, which is available here on YouTube. And I, I was reading a lot about the Zodiac Killer, so that just made me curious about astrology. And I'm not the biggest believer in astrology, but I did learn certain people reading abilities. And I actually got pretty good at guessing a few times about people's Zodiac signs. And this um this course, it seems like, a it, course in the form of a book, actually is uh, teaching people how to do that. Why he chose to call this Zodiac Killer, I have no idea, other than simply, again, trying to use the name of a serial killer to attract um, attract viewers and buyers to his audience. It, I mean, the difference between my series, though, and this is that you don't have to pay any money for it. He's charging $15 for this Zodiac Killer book. Zodiac Killer, the multi-phase mentalism routine. I mean, you shouldn't really be charging money for something like that, if you ask me, because... Or at the very least, very least, why doesn't he just call it Chinese Zodiac People Reading Ability Course or something like that? Okay, that's a terrible name. All right, all right, I'll give credit to uh, Moses Sandeep. That he, that's why he wouldn't have done that, but I just think that this is kind of going off in another bizarre direction. But in this episode, I also said I was going to talk about the Zodiac Black Dahlia connection once again. And the Citizen Detective podcast series released a two-part episode, or they released two episodes about 
The Black Dahlia, and The Murder of Elizabeth Short from 1947. As previously stated, there are several theorists out there who believe that the Zodiac Killer and the Black Dahlia Avenger were one and the same. Steve Hodell, David Gold, John Cameron, who was also previously mentioned here in this episode. And in the second episode of um, Citizen Detective's Black Dahlia, a series was quite different than the first. I mean, if you go to my interview with Cloyd Steiger, he is a frequent guest on the show, and I told him on Black Box Online Radio that I thought that the first part of their Black Dahlia series was possibly the best episode that they had done on the Citizen Detective podcast. But with the second one, I noticed that even some people in the comments section were really pushing back a lot, and I think the reason why was they were talking about Elizabeth Short in somewhat of an unfavorable light, talking, I mean, one quote from Cloyd Steiger was, she wasn't a prostitute, but she was as close to one as you could get without actually being one. Okay, that's a paraphrase quote, and I was surprised by some of this. One person even wrote in their chat that, normally I love your show, but this is just dragging her name through the mud. This is slut-shaming, and that is a, that is a direct quote that was that that term was used she said that they were slut shaming elizabeth short and normally i am always on the side of the podcasters if they're just trying to look at the facts and conduct true crime analysis i think that we in the audience were just surprised that they were going to present this type of information about elizabeth short because most people recognize that she was the victim most people recognize that she didn't deserve to be murdered and from the first part of the of the Citizen Detective podcast, they really show how it's quite possible that she was tortured a lot prior to her death. And they 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 really explored the theories very well in part one, looking about how the killer could have been a cannibal. I mean, all types of things that you wouldn't think about normally with the Black Dahlia case. But in the second one, they talked about how Elizabeth Short had multiple male partners. Again, I'm being careful with my words that she would often use men to cover certain expenses in her life. And she did live in a house with other women, but she would skip out on her obligations to pay the rent. And they presented this um, caricature of Elizabeth Short that was not very flattering. And I think that a lot of people just weren't expecting to hear that, because when I look at the Black Dahlia case, mostly we think about I think about how Elizabeth Short was very, very savagely cut apart. And I know that by saying the word savage, some people might take that in the wrong way. She was carefully cut in half, like she was bisected. She was cut through the second and third lumbar vertebrae in that space there. And someone had a very, very strong attention to detail. That's why some people even believe that Elizabeth Short was murdered as part of a twisted surrealist art project. But they actually proposed somebody that was quite contrary to Steve Hodell's Black Dahlia Avenger theory. And for the longest time, I thought that Steve Hodell was on, on the right track. He believes that his father, George Hill Hodell, was not only the Zodiac Killer, but also the Black Dahlia Avenger, more famously the Black Dahlia Avenger. And while I don't think too highly of George Hodell as a Zodiac suspect, I mean, Steve Hodell's narrative on the Black Dahlia case seemed almost spot on, except that... The um, Citizen Detective podcast put forward some evidence that would not exactly rule him out, but definitely go against him. They proposed that there was a stronger suspect named Leslie Dillon, Les Dillon, and he worked as a hotel bellhop for a while, but he was also a morgue assistant, or mortician's assistant, so he would have been familiar with with things like how to handle bodies, and familiar with dealing with cadavers, and dealing with human remains. And the reason why is they created this profile about how the Black Dahlia Avenger was someone who was in their mid-twenties, who was able to lure Elizabeth Short to a location by being very charming, and then he decided to murder her. And some of the possibilities that were explored were that it might not have even been extremely premeditated, he might have just been bothered by something that she said, and he had the he had the idea in his mind that he was going to commit a murder at some point, but that it was not even extremely 
plan, just something set him off. Maybe she did something unintentionally that provoked him, and then he decided to escalate the brutality with the excessive mutilations. And there are also different reasons why somebody would be cut apart the way Elizabeth Short was. And I shared some of this on the most recent live stream. Every every Thursday I do a live stream about the um about true crime cases. I mean that's just the live Thursday. And what I was saying was they put forward three points. There are three reasons why people would dismember the bodies of the victims. Number one would be concealing, number two would be transporting, and number three would be communicating like they want to make the remains easier to move around. They want to also want to hide them and communicating would be sending a message. And they, there can be more than one. There can be more than one. There can be overlap. And that's absolutely what I think the murder of Elizabeth Short was. I think that that was done to communicate. I don't really think that someone just decided to cut her body apart and dispose of her remains because it was convenient. I believe that her remains were specifically left there. Now, what about the Zodiac Killer in the 1960s? Did the Zodiac co try to communicate messages with the victims and their bodies? No, absolutely not. The Zodiac committed the Lake Herman Road murders and he fired some gunshots and ran away. The Zodiac did the same thing at the Blue Rock Spring shooting. Gunshots, drove away. Then the Zodiac commits the Lake Berryessa stabbing. He didn't do anything to the victims. He didn't even try to excessively brutalize them. He didn't even leave a signature on the victims' bodies. The Zodiac would then walk to a car that was parked by Brian Hartnell's Carmen Kia, and he wrote a message on the car door. That's communicating. But the Zodiac isn't actually trying to communicate anything, to the best of my knowledge, by altering the victims' bodies in some ways. The Zodiac seems to be the type of person that wants to go on and use the letters and the phone calls. He's using actual language as forms of communications, with the exception of taking Paul Stein's shirt in the taxi, because that's what I was going to say next. The Zodiac is also not leaving any type of signature on the victim's bodies, and he is... He, t he murdered Paul Stein on October 11th of 1969 and cut off a piece of Paul Stein's bloody shirt and then took the shirt piece, cut it into parts, and milled it in with multiple letters. Again, that's using the actual communications like letters. Now, when I mean about communicating something by using the victim's bodies, some killers will, let's say, slit the victim's throat. That would be something that they do very regularly, especially if they're trying to leave it as a type of signature, or that he's not leaving anything on their bodies. There was a YouTube channel out there called ZNN Zodiac News Network that said the Zodiac Killer tattooed messages on the victim's teeth and they would go through dental records and they found them? Absolutely not. I also don't think that that has any particular type of merit or value. But then, on the Citizen Detective podcast, they also shared some other reasons uh, that people would become violent. And I shared a little bit of this in the last live stream, but in case you didn't hear it. And there are three major reasons why people would turn toward violence against another person. Number one would be defensive. Number two would be frustration, and number three would be hyper-intense violence. And defensive would just be someone's trying to hurt you while you use force to stop them. They're trying to punch you in the face. You hold your hand up and you block it. If they keep trying to punch you, then you hit them back. That would be defensive violence. Now, the second level is something that I think we experience a lot, but people don't always like to talk about it, and that is frustration. Meaning that even if someone isn't physically trying to attack you, you believe that this person is causing a problem for you in your life, so you are trying to respond with physical force. And then there's just the hyper-intense violence, which would be the cold methodical and calculating serial killers or things like assassins and hitmen. Now, where does the Zodiac Killer fall into that category? Absolutely, the Zodiac is hyper-intense violence. I mean, he certainly is not even being provoked by David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen at Lake Herman Road. I mean, he's just walking up to the cars at, like, Blue Rock Springs. It's the same thing. He doesn't have any reason to be defensive. I mean, they're not physically trying to hurt them. He is targeting these people, and he is initiating everything. But was the Zodiac also frustrated, meaning the frustrated type of violence? 
where he thought that his actions were justified possibly possibly because one person who would dispute that heavily would be ray grant um author of zodiac killer solve he believes that everything was calculated as a giant conceptual art project but then other people whom ray grant likes to call out such as richard grinnell says that richard grinnell just believes in the sad little man theory well if the zodiac turns out to be a sad little man then it would be that type of frustrated violence where think of somebody like the son of sam shooter where someone just feels rejected from society they're envious of couples and there's also maybe a reason why he chose to murder paul stein it could be both of those but absolutely i think that the zodiac goes into the hyper intense violent category but what do you guys think you can put your ideas in the comment section down below share anything that you like and i mean i would also just um encourage you to leave any type of comment that you want but i would want to move on to the next segment now and first i'll go to your supporter shout outs one more time anybody who supports the show on buymeacoffee.com or using the super thanks on youtube will get a shout out on zodiac monday and our shout outs this week go to batman 66 and river prawn pottery thank you guys so much regular and consistent supporters you are amazing and batman 66 also had a book recommendation for me and it's called titwillow by judith chapman and it talks about a Zodiac killer suspect whom I had never heard before called Peter Plant. And um, I know it sounds like he's right out of a nursery rhyme or something, but that was his name, Peter Plant. I honestly think that Peter Plant and Gary Post would be pretty good friends or something, solely for the fact that we could just make up nursery rhymes about them. Peter Plant picked a peck of pickled peppers and Gary Post was a house painter. Okay, it's a lot harder than it seems. Anyway, I mean, his name's Peter Plant, and this is actually her late husband. The, Judith Chapman is the author of the book Titwillow that talks about Peter Plant as a Zodiac suspect. She was married to him for a while. She met him when he was, or they got married when she was, she was 20 and he was 29, but she began to suspect that there was something wrong. And this book will talk about how her late husband could have been the Zodiac killer. Now, I pulled up the free sample from Kindle, as I do with a lot of these books, before I choose to purchase them to try and just test the waters a little bit. And I did like how she titled the book Titwillow as a reference to the Mikado, whom the Zodiac... Well, the Zodiac was a rather big fan of the Mikado, but I did notice that she didn't spell it the way the Zodiac did. The Zodiac wrote about the Mikado in the Exorcist letter in 1974 when it says, He plunged himself into the billowy wave and an echo arose from the suicide's grave, Titwillow, Titwillow, Titwillow. But Titwillow was misspelled on the Exorcist letter, and the first person that pointed that out um, to me, and I mean the first time I read about this observation, it was from Gareth Penn in his book Time 17. But some points about Peter Plant. Number one. He was five feet, nine and a half inches tall. I think that that's somewhat reasonable. I mean, I think that that is absolutely within the realm of acceptable parameters. I usually say the Zodiac was going to be between five feet, eight and six inches. Five feet, eight inches tall and six feet tall. I estimate to be around five, ten and a half and five, nine and a half. Sure. He was a student at San Jose State University at the time, and she believes that he committed the Lake Herman Road murders while he was on Christmas break, on Christmas vacation. They occurred on December 20th of 1968. Other people have talked about this as well with their suspects, and again, I think that's a reasonable observation. But Peter Plant was a competitive gymnast, and he paid very close attention to his weight because he was, well, he had to monitor it because of gymnastics, and he was 169 and a half pounds at the time when he was a gymnast at San Jose State, and I believe the exact quotation in the book says, he never went above 169 and a half pounds. Now this is a problem, because, number one, the Zodiac Killer was not described as having an athletic body type by anyone. It was more or less, he was beefy, but not overly fat, built like an offensive lineman, perhaps. Not really in line with being a 169-pound gymnast. We also have the foot impressions from Lake Berryessa. They were estimated to have come from somebody who was 200 to 225 pounds. So this guy is almost too small to be the Zodiac killer. At first I was like, okay, I totally want to hear you out. And it doesn't mean he's eliminated completely, but it does show that he's on the smaller side. And Brian Hartle and Cecilia Shepard spent... 
around 15 minutes with the Zodiac Killer, and they talked about how he had this big pouch stomach and he was barrel-chested. And again, are you going to look at a competitive gymnast and get those exact types of reactions? Now, some people have brought this to my attention saying, well, wait a second, wait a second. Couldn't he have just been a thin guy who was wearing multiple layers of clothing? Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, even talked about wearing two different overcoats, or he would wear two jackets to disguise his appearance. I mean, couldn't he have just done that? Well, sure, sure, but how would you have the altered details? How would you have the... How would you respond to the details such as the estimations that he was 200 to 225 pounds from the foot impressions, from the impressions of the Zodiac, hack shoes, and the Lake Berryessa, how would that be accounted for in that theory? And I honestly think that it's not. Now, I'll look more into Peter Plant, and I'll see if Judith Chapman has come up with some other material about her suspect. But as for now, I mean, I'm just going to put him in the hard maybe pile, definitely leaning toward the lower end of probably not. But thank you so much for listening to this week's Zodiac Monday, and if you have anything that you'd like to share for the program, you can always contact me at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is now the Black Box Online Radio Facebook page, which is up and running. I've had it for several years, but I haven't done it a lot with it in the past. And there will also be true crime interviews that will be released on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I go live every Thursday, starting at 8 a.m., Eastern Standard Time. You can start your day with some true crime talk radio in the morning. On Fridays, I'm doing Zodiac Killer interviews or trying my best. And this weekend, we will see the conclusion of my audiobook for Killer on a White Horse, A Story of the Evening Watchman. And then I will begin the next series for Down the Dark Lane, Three Thrillers from the Motel. That will be released in audiobook form, too. And I'm finally underway with working on the sequel to Killer on a White Horse. I guess it's not really a sequel because there the sequel story is in Down the Dark Lane. The final epi like the final story in the book is the sequel to Killer on a White Horse. This is the threequel and that will be released hopefully hopefully next year. But I'm openly asking you guys, please don't buy my books from amazon.com. I just haven't bothered to take them down yet. If you want to follow along with the story, all you have to do is listen to the audiobooks that are coming out on YouTube. There are way too many typos and errors in my paperback version of both books. So I just invite people to listen to the audiobooks on YouTube, and I'll be working with professional editors in the future and such. But please feel free to tune in this weekend for Killer on a White Horse, Story of the Evening Watchman, the finale. All right, well, that's all for me now, and I will see you guys over on Instagram. Goodbye.